Hey there, live like you know, color gals. Having been on this planet for several decades, we've had chip happen in our closest relationships, like with a spouse or a partner, aging parents, adult children, and female friends. How have these relationships shaped us? And what can we do with the tougher times of these relationships to become stronger, healthier, and happier? That's what we're exploring in an episode mini-series I'm calling Women's Essential Relationships. So far, we've talked about how to have a personal breakthrough if you've experienced a midlife breakup, and also about what caregiving with confidence looks like if you're caring for aging parents. Today, we're exploring your relationship with adult children who are estranged. I have a close friend whose son suddenly wrote she and her husband out of his life. I can't even imagine. She doesn't talk about it much, but I know the unanswered questions and the pain are always lingering in her heart and mind. Today's guest, Tina Gilbertson, says that, quote, while in and of itself, time does not necessarily heal, actions do. We're going to talk about what actions she recommends and why, because being estranged from an adult child is much more common than you may realize. But first, before we dive in, do you know your nail color persona and what it reveals about you? I have a quiz that'll tell you. Super easy, fun, and spot on. Just go to livelikeyournailcolor.com and click on what's my nail color persona. Answer a few quick questions and in your results, discover your specific nail color persona, your built-in strengths, and how to tap into those strengths when chip happens. Again, Go to livelikeyournailcolor.com. Now, let's keep this mini-series going. Tired of so much chip happening? Discouraged by so much downer news? Weary from chronic crisis? Don't let the chips keep you down. Welcome to the Live Like Your Nail Color podcast, where the tips of your fingers and toes are ready to inspire you to not give up and to keep creating the business, career, and life you want. In each episode, we flip the chip and let our fun nail color with that crazy fun name cheer us on to remember our strengths, embrace the power of choice, see life as an adventure, and know resilience is only a touch-up or change-up away. Get ready for a good time and a good laugh with your host, Mary Foley. Hey again, Live Like Your Nail Color Gals. When I reached out to Tina Gilbertson, to talk with us about adult child estrangement. She said, I wish my topic were more fun, but I'd like to chat with you about it regardless. People need to know they're not alone if they're having trouble with their adult children and that there is hope for those relationships. Well, that's when I knew for sure I had asked the right gal pal to come alongside us. You know, there are parents with adult children and those children have cut them off and those You know, those moms and dads are wondering, how did this happen? Where did I go wrong? What happened to my loving child? And those questions keep going on in their head. And over time and holidays and birthdays and even the birth of a grandchild, all those things can pass and there's nothing else but silence. But we're talking today because, as Tina said, there is hope. Tina is a psychotherapist, author, estrangement consultant, and author of the book, Reconnecting with Your Estranged Adult Child, Practical Tips and Tools to Heal Your Relationship. She cuts through the blame, shame, and guilt on both sides of the broken relationship and offers some techniques and tools to parents who have felt powerless. She really believes that reconciliation is a step-by-step process, but the effort is well worth it. It is never too late to renew relations and experience better than ever bonds. And I'm so looking forward to this conversation. Thank you for being here and welcome to the Live Like Your Nail Color podcast, Tina. Thank you so much, Mary. And thank you for that excellent introduction. I'm excited to talk to you today because I really, I know that a lot of people experience this problem and they don't always get to hear about it or talk about it to people. Yeah, and I... In the in kind of some research on this topic, because I don't have any children, so they don't have can't have adult children, and I don't have um estranged adult children, but I have a good friend who does. And that gave me some insight into this. And I thought, that's the only person I know for sure. But as I've thought about, you know, women in this kind of middle age plus range where 
we there's so many who have adult children and we've had some tough times especially the last few years and lots of chip have happened i think this is happening likely way more often than is talked about even amongst friends so um you know that's what i like to do here on the live like your nail color podcast is bring forth some topics that um I wouldn't necessarily say are taboo, but maybe just under discussed and mm-hmm. bring, bring some light to where some of those corners of darkness can be um, and put on a good nail color, you know, while we're doing it, right? Because right. <laughs> we need some good energy, which makes me think of, you know, that whenever I uh, have new guests on, I always say, all right, before we get into our topic, we want to find out a little bit more about you. And that is really your nail color persona. So um, I know I asked you to take my quiz. What's your nail color persona? So what did that reveal about you and did it nail you? Well, as you can see, I'm a naked Nelly, and I love the description, you know, but I, I think it was maybe a little bit generous. In my case, I feel like I don't I don't paint my nails because by the time I take a shower and brush my teeth, I feel like I've spent enough time on personal grooming and, <laughs> and I'm just, you know, too lazy to keep going. So uh, but I do like the description of the Naked Nelly as being authentic and uh, soothing to be with. Uh, I like that very much. Well, as a psychotherapist, that can be incredibly valuable asset and characteristic to have. Your voice even sounds that way. I mean, you know, I know I can get like uh, uh, revved up and I can get all excited. But, you know, your voice kind of calms me down. Like, let's just be in that moment. Could I offer to you? to reframe this, I'm just now done with personal care in a positive way of you're low maintenance. You are just low (laughs) maintenance when it comes to personal care. And that is a really freeing thing. Good for you. I think that's a gift you have, Mary, to, to, to put that positive spin and, and in some ways to find reframes that are actually true and wonderful and make people feel better about themselves. So thanks. Oh, oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Well, oftentimes I say, well, you know, uh, if you have, if you wear any color, you know, and that's what, of course, what the quiz does, it says, well, you know, is there more that reveals about you? But if you're naked, your fingers and toes, is that's what, that's what I'm hearing, right? So you're, yeah. you're actually only in 80, I think it's 16%. I did a survey of all women that I surveyed. Only 16% are totally naked or naked. There is a difference between <laughs> naked and naked. And I always like to bring this up. It doesn't that happen often. But so if you're naked, uh, that means you don't have anything on. If you're naked, you don't have anything on and you're up to something. Oh, <laughs> oh <laughs> right. geez. I know. So let's just see if we can be up to something here and, and talk about this kind of touchy, emotionally loaded topic, but give some hope to some gals listening. Let's just talk kind of about estrangement overall. Why does estrangement from adult children often happen? And what are some of the most common causes you've seen in your practice with those you work with? Yeah. In some ways, it depends on who you're talking to, because if you talk to the parents, they are much more likely than the adult children to notice things like third parties you know, in-laws, uh, maybe the other parent has, has spoken ill of them, or um, they might look at divorce and say, my children are still mad at me about divorcing. They, Or they might look at financial problems. There are all kinds of issues, infertility even. There right. are all kinds of issues that can come up in the parent-child relationship. And Parents are are more likely to point to those, according to research, than adult children are. According to adult children, uh, it's it's more often, from their point of view, a lack of support, acceptance, or psychological space. So the adult child is more likely to point to the relationship between themselves and the parent to look for the issues that are really fueling estrangement. And You know, I think there are a lot of factors that can contribute, but maybe it does come down to how people feel Mm -hmm. in the relationship. Yeah. You know, I was, you know, you've, you've birthed this child, you've, you've done everything to care for them as an infant, brought them all the way through all the school and, and all the things of growing up and socializing and all of that. And, and then to then get to some point in adulthood and then they don't feel potentially supported or some acceptance and they, they need, you know, more space. I can see, and as, as a mother, 
going, but I've done all these things for you. It can't be that basic thing. It's got to be some other event in your life, like infertility or financial problems or, or uh, it's something. And what I'm hearing is, is, well, maybe we might overcomplicate it and we have to. Look yeah, up. I think you're so right. I mean, I, it feels like a kick in the pants. Yeah. Yeah. Really, t- t- when because the parents are very much more aware of the sacrifices and efforts that they made on for their children than children are, and yes, I think you're right that it they're thinking it can't be that basic because I did those things. I yeah. do love my child. I have always supported them. I did this and this and this in order to support them. So it it can't be that. So and, and what it comes down to is it is it. There was a disconnect somewhere along the way where the parent was making these sincere, honest, real efforts in a certain direction. And sometimes those efforts don't land in the way that the parent intends. (laughs) I'm I'm laughing only because you just sparked a memory of me and my mom. Okay, in early adulthood, I wanted to say back off. (laughs) I did in my my actions and I was like, oh. What can't you trust me at this point? I like what evidence have I given you thus far that I am, you know, going to basically be a, a loser in life? I mean, that's kind of what it was, and I just was so frustrated, and I I wanted to, you know, distance myself, which a new job enabled that to happen because I literally moved, you know, to another to another place. But I I can I can see I. I I kind of still in that moment, I understood she, her fear was, you're never going to move out. Now you get a job. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh, you know, and, but I wanted to say, trust me, trust me. Come on. God, I've got this far in life. Yeah. It's so great that you brought that up because that's pretty common. The parent has a fear of some kind for their child. You know, they want to see their child thrive. They want to be sure they're going to be okay. And, and the fear comes across to the child as anxiety about you're not good enough, you're not competent, you're not going to do it right, you're going to fail. And so it's not, you don't hear the fear and the anxiety. What comes at you initially is judgment or criticism Mm. or something else that you don't want and that you want to distance yourself from. So that's a perfect example of a mismatch between what's in a parent's heart and what comes across to the child. I think one of the things that I, I, I'm anticipating a lot of, you know, parents who have estranged kids right now that, that goes through their mind again and again. The question is, is, am I a bad parent? Was I a bad parent if I have an estrangement from my adult child? I mean, because I did all the right things and this has happened. Yeah. So yeah. Can you speak to that. Absolutely. And it's such a painful question to ask. And parents do. If you scratch the surface of any parent, you find a fear that they're not a good parent. And it's so sad uh, and just so often really misplaced. It It's not, estrangement is not a punishment for having been a bad parent. Mm-hmm. It's not a punishment. It feels like it. It feels very personal. It feels like you were so bad. I'm going to punish you by withholding myself. Um, and you know, the, that's what the silent treatment is about, which I think is different from estrangement. Silent treatment is a punishment. I don't like what you said. I'm not talking to you for a week. And hopefully that does the trick. This silent treatment is not estrangement. Uh, and it's not because the parent is bad. Um, and we can talk about why that is, but I do want to say that luck plays a role. I've met people whose parents sounded really, really quite uh, abusive when they recounted their childhood. And yet these children are very, very tight with their parents. They're still close. They buy them things. They do things for them. They're, they're always there. And how is that possible if those parents were so bad? That those parents really kind of yeah. seemed kind of bad, yeah. but they didn't, they didn't, be, the kids didn't become estranged. So there is an element of luck. There is an element of temperament. We're not all born the same. We're not all born the same. Uh, That's not to say that anybody is born to estrange, but some temperaments get along better with with others. So there is an element of luck. And all parents make mistakes. All parents are imperfect and flawed. And not all parents become estranged. There's a lot more to it than that. 
all kids also help children exactly and perfect and they're flawed as well i mean it's it takes two right to tango exactly to like wow yes. what's 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 happened here I'm curious if in the last few years, especially with all the challenge and the change that everyone has experienced, um, have these circumstances increased parents and children, uh, adult children being estranged? That's an excellent question. And I think it's fair to say that we don't really know. Mm -hmm. Uh, Anecdotally, I can say that in some cases, parents and children were brought back together Mm. by, by the pandemic. And in other cases, it just solidified the estrangement or or I have heard from parents whose estrangements began during the pandemic. So it, it can really go either way. And I don't think we know overall what effect it's had, but it certainly has intensified relationships of all kinds. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, it just, it turned up the volume on everything in all the dynamics of our lives. Um, both internal uh, relationship with ourself and the, and relationship with others. Um, okay, well, you know, it's it's one of those things. I always find that crisis creates clarity, and sometimes it gets the clarity of I like this person more or I don't. I mean, we saw increase of divorces, but we also saw couples getting closer, and we saw some more babies. So you know, it's com- coming out of that. Um, right. But I just had to ask because in the context of things, so. You know, it's so easy to feel powerless. You were we yeah. just kind of saying, you know, there's, there's, uh, it could, it could feel like punishment, but it's not really. It, it could uh, each are playing a role. Luck, though, can have a part in it. Temperament can have a part of it. You know, um, but when your child just won't talk to you, that's when you really feel powerless, and you really try different angles and such. What can a parent do? to reconcile that relationship with an estranged adult child with, by the way, I don't want to preface it. Going, I'm not expecting you to, your answer to be any magic wand. Cause if it were that easy, we all would have done it if we've right. had a situation. So, you know, it's a loaded question, but could you give us at least, you know, a, a high level and, and some hope? Yes, absolutely. Powerlessness is what I see probably most often in parents because of the aspects of the situation that are not in their control. The fact is their kid is not talking to them, not responding or whatever. What can you really do? You're almost, it's a setup to feel powerless. And unfortunately, parents forget about the inherent power in the role of the capital P parent. Your child has only one mother and one father and and our parents are always throughout our lives in a different category from friends and spouses and co-workers our parents are are just quietly carry more power than i think most people realize because we're human and we feel small and vulnerable and people hurt us and we don't really see our power and when i talk about power as parents i'm not talking about power over i'm talking about just holding power within yourself and recognizing the influence that you have. So, and, and one thing that you, I would say the first thing that you can do, even if your child isn't talking to you, there's no way to reach them. You can take steps to repair the relationship. One thing, the first thing you want to try to do, and this can take some time, is to understand the reasons from the child's point of view, why they're seeking distance. And that can be a really painful project for parents because thinking about why someone doesn't want to return your calls is not a, it's not a happy thing to do. Um, but it is a necessary project if you want to heal the estrangement. Um, I think it's important to look at estrangement as a symptom that a relationship needs repair rather than as something crazy that your child has just suddenly decided to do for no good reason because they're because they're selfish or because someone else got into their lives and whispered in their ear or because of something that's you know just completely incomprehensible that's not a a constructive way to look at estrangement so i encourage people to parents to look at estrangement as a symptom that the relationship needs repair. And the first way to repair the relationship is to understand how it went wrong. So I guess that's also, you know, and you're kind of brainstorming if someone did this to brainstorm uh, all, all kinds of possibilities. 
uh, almost yes. like without um, criticism or judgment on yourself. No, like that's from my point key. of view, I, yeah. I, you know, like how I might see it, what the under uh, to understand the car. Okay, from their point of view, what it might look like. From you know, I, I would just think you've got to really throw all possibilities, even if they're crazy pants. And yeah. that can somewhat help because, you know, it might help open up. Oh, I hadn't thought about that kind of a thing. Yes. And in that brainstorm, you might want to avail yourself of a little bit of education because what you might come up with is that time that I said this to her, she didn't like it. Or that time he and I had this altercation or that time, you know, that Estrangement is not about that time that something happened. It's usually about something a little bit more subtle and underlying, like a relationship dynamic. So learning about parent-adult-child or parent-child relationships in particular can help you, can equip you to do that brainstorm well. Like, oh, uh, for example, when my spouse uh, died or when I was divorced and I became a single parent, I really relied on my oldest, who was very capable and very loving and very there for me. And when that happens, uh, sometimes later on, there's a real painful pulling away where the child needs to now step into adulthood as an individual and cannot be that helpful partner anymore or that emotional support anymore. So these are, you know... When you're talking about brainstorming, these are kind of high level things that you kind of need to know about in order to even come up with them. And that's where education comes in. And like, for example, we can get that education. I mean, your book is one source for that, as well as if you just start to maybe Google that, or is it something you say, I'd be careful about what you might just read in a random article? I would absolutely be careful about what you might read okay. in a random article. You might yes. get too many ideas there. <laughs> People not- get in trouble uh, Googling things. I wouldn't say never do your research online, but you know, I would look at books like mine or books about p- the parent-child relationship to get a, con- a, a, a view with context of that relationship and the ways it can go wrong. And another way to do it is with a good therapist. You know, a family therapist or a counselor who our training is in lifespan development and family dynamics and and things that most people don't go to school for and don't necessarily, aren't necessarily aware of. We live things rather than study them. So a therapist has training. Yeah. I love to contextualize. Understanding more about um, why, what might be. yeah. that's happening from the child's point of view is I love this because it even I can do this with nothing changing in my immediate circumstance with my adult child. And I can start to feel a little more of that power back. And again, not a dominating power, but not a hopelessness either. You're trying to get like, okay, let me get a little more equipped in understanding this and get beyond what I know already have what's already gone through my mind a bazillion times and kept me up at night. I love that you underlined that fact. It's incredibly important to realize that you can repair this relationship without the participation of your child. You can at least build the foundation for the next phase of your relationship without them participating and without them even telling you what the problem was. There's a lot that parents can do to explore just again, by learning about parent-adult-child relationships and also, by the way, by looking at your own family of origin. What happened between you and your mom or your dad? And what was that like for you? And what did you vow never to do with your children or always to do with your children? And how did that come into play? There's a lot of sources of good information, but uh, it's extremely important while you're doing that, and we're talking about how not to feel powerless and what to do when your child won't talk to you, one is understand as best you can from their point of view. Uh, two, three, and four are all about um, boosting your resilience. I love it already. This is fantastic. Okay. Chip happens, but you can put on another coat. It's a change up or, you know, it's 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 a touch up. That's what I always say about when it comes to your nails. Of course, you're not na- wearing nail color. So you low maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> right to the two, three. Right. Okay, I'm sorry. Right. I, I just got too excited about that. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> so th- these three points are key, and people, parents, 
to me, it seems to me that they don't give them enough weight. They don't pay them enough attention. Number two is develop self-compassion. I can't stress the importance of this. Why should I develop self-compassion? My child has already judged me and is criticizing me enough to to say I'm terrible and to stay away from me. What does self-compassion have to do with that? And that's a that's a big topic that we'd probably have to spend all day talking about it, but maybe I'll just say trust me, self-compassion is a foundational um tool to have in your toolkit. Uh The next thing is find your own center. And, you know, that's about embodiment, being in your body, being basically comfortable in this moment where you are. What does that have to do with your child? Everything in a way, even when they're not here with you. It's almost as if, especially when the relationship is troubled, they can sense that you're not okay. So finding your own center and developing com- self-compassion, these are shoring up the parent. And the parent is the foundation for the relationship with the parent and the child. Without that foundation of self-compassion and being centered, y- you can't be the, the, the parent who can repair the relationship. So. Okay? Yeah, I can. I, I'd like to make a comment on both those two, number two and three. This develop self compassion. I love that you said self compassion. It's akin to, in some ways, the word and the phrase self care. Mm-hmm. We hear a lot about self care, and self care is important. You know, because if you're not taking care of yourself, don't expect other people to. That's the way I look at it. Right. That's I mean, right. So, but. This is also, as you're caring, be compassionate to yourself. It's not just good to do good things for yourself and give yourself stress breaks or what, but be compassionate. This is a tough situation. And to say, I, I really did my best. I knew how to do in the time I did it. If I, now knowing what I know and now having these experiences, I could go back and I might, I would have parented slightly differently. I don't think there's a parent on this planet who wouldn't say that, right? That's absolutely Particularly, true. Yeah. Well, no, there, those are only the parents who really care. And there mm-hmm. are some people I'm sure on the fringes who psychologically don't care. They just reproduced and life went on. But that's not who's listening to this podcast. I can tell you that right now. But I love that developing that self-compassion. So if you're doing self-care, add this deliberate, compassionate component and, and remind yourself that you really gave it your best shot and you're continuing to because even while you're estranged, you're putting forth effort You're and your heart and your head is, is still in it. So would that be accurate to say? Absolutely. Okay. Yes, and 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 you're suffering, by the way. And wow. how much compassion do you have for that person who is so sad, or so angry, or so just struggling and in knots? How much compassion do you have for that person? And a lot of people have trouble with that, honestly. When you talk to them about self compassion and and loving themselves, they're like, you know, would love to, but I just really can't get there. I have never felt that way toward myself, and I just I don't see how I could do it. Mm. And it's kind of and that's a good point you know we 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 don't if when we haven't maybe received enough compassion and and empathy in our lives we don't know what it looks like or what it would feel like to experience that i I would say that's you're not off the hook though all you've done is pinpoint i mean that's what i need to work on that's what i need to work on in myself yeah i'm thinking if we don't have some compassion for ourselves how Mm -hmm. are we going to move forward period in this right let alone others but how do we develop the self-compassion? I mean, telling somebody you need to have compassion for yourself <laughs> is one thing. <laughs> but, so a, a couple of things. One is act as though you did okay. have compassion for yourself. Maybe, okay. uh, you know, go to sleep when you're tired, that sort of thing. Act as though you care about this poor person who's very tired or this poor person who's so hungry they need to eat right now. Another thing is, again, I hate to be a billboard for therapy, but one thing people do learn in good therapy is how to be kind to themselves and how to have compassion. Because when you sit across from a therapist who has compassion for you, mm. who cares that you're suffering, who who doesn't say, you know, you brought this on yourself, that's not compassion. When you have somebody who really cares for you, then you have a picture. This is what it looks like. This is what compassion looks like. And, and it seems like I deserve it because this person is giving it to me. 
I did a therapy for a number of years because of going through, well, separation and divorce. So different situation, but still my experience with, with therapy. And here's one thing that was so valuable from the very beginning. A compassionate, that happened to be a woman sitting across from me who didn't know me beforehand. And because of that, she was a mirror to me. So she would notice things about me that honestly I, I, I had disconnected from or I needed to be reminded of. And they were all things, particularly at first, that were kind of showing me like, you, you're a good person. You've got some good things going here that, you know, and then and then we kind of got through, well, there are some things that could be worked on here. But she gave me some understanding. That was a little bit later in, in the sessions. But her, she continued to be a mirror through the entire process. And that was invaluable. That's a great metaphor for good therapy is you do get mirrored. It's called accurate empathy. You know, I see you. I yeah. see you, the real you. I don't just see what I want to see or what I'm afraid you are. I see you. And that that's, I love that mirror analogy. Yeah. So talking about um, what to do when your child won't talk to you and what, what you can do. Mm-hmm. We talked about developing self-compassion, finding your own center. That's a whole thing that might involve breathing and meditation and mindful movement and stuff, we don't realize how disembodied we are. And we don't realize the impact that our ha- that, that has on relationships. So maybe hmm. just think about how embodied you, you are from, from moment to moment in your life. And the fourth point I was going to make uh, was pretty, pretty simple and short. Get support. If you have unresolved trauma, which many people I work with do, actually. I talk to a lot of people who were abandoned in childhood in various ways, who may have been the children of emotional neglect, either benign or otherwise. Uh, that Those are early wounds, and they can get kicked up when estrangement happens. You know, you may be going on in life doing just fine and, and putting your head to the to to the task at hand and and then suddenly your child becomes estranged and all of these other things come home to roost all of the abandonment the rejection the the fear of loss uh, you know loss in general it all comes up and that's why it's so excruciating for so many parents so if you do have and most of us have some small t trauma from childhood if not capital t trauma uh get support to work through that not because you are you have shortcomings or you're flawed, but because you are a human being who deserves love and healing. If you're carrying around unhealed wounds, um, you don't have to necessarily continue to carry those in the state that they're in. There may be healing here that wants to happen. Mm. Wow. I, I was thinking about how there could be some people who have had early wounds they might not even be in touch with like maybe they never process them because it was so they were so young um or they have processed them or they think they have like you know it's like like well i dealt with that before yeah i went to counseling before or yeah i worked through that that's done and over and then and then this happens and with an estranged adult child and because they have they're looking more within Maybe that's not quite over. Or maybe I now it's the time I need to pick up, pick it up again and don't beat myself up that it's not over, but goes now maybe there's another layer here that I couldn't have seen before, but I need to see now. What you're saying is exactly my experience much mm-hmm. of the time that people either are unaware of, of some of what they've experienced or not what they've experienced, but the impact of early experiences. And in some ways, the worse the trauma, the more that may be true. You know, when you had a horrific childhood, children are very uh, adaptive and they learn how to put things aside and they learn how to to get along anyway and and make things happen for themselves and be there for themselves. So sometimes things haven't been processed at all. Other times I meet with people who've had years of therapy, uh, good therapy even, but the the core injuries have not been addressed. Maybe there was more talk than than feeling in therapy, or maybe there just wasn't enough time. Maybe they did all the right things, but there's such a backlog that it needed more time. Often, 
people may be aware uh, of of early wounding, but they don't put two and two together. What does that have to do with this estrangement? Oh, this is the that. worst thing. Yeah. yeah, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. That other thing back in the past, that was nothing. I got over that. They don't. They don't recognize the connection. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would make that would make a lot of sense. And having someone trained like yourself to talk to really brings an asset to the to the conversation to the table. Um, even even though we have to uh, do we, we essentially we have to do the work, you know. But to have yeah. someone like yourself that really is trained to hone in and identify some of those connections and then present. I know, again, going back to my, um, my divorce, my therapist would uh, one time, you know, made a suggestion. I think she's probably said it something like, well, consider that. And then I fill in the blank, but it had to do with a dynamic in my family of origin. So see, that's, that was before my husband, right? That, contributed or maybe set me up completely for this to happen in my marriage. I don't think a friend would have said that. Okay. <laughs> Just saying. Right. Because right. it wouldn't have we well, wouldn't have had the training or he wouldn't have had the training to, to to identify that, right? Right. So yes. so that's the, to me the fine tuning. I remember that and she gave me a clinical term too as well. And I was like, oh Oh, wow. You know, so uh, actually I also, it was, it was empowering by the way, because I was also learning and I was understanding and I went, oh, but the connection, I went, this is playing out in a way I never could have anticipated. Right. And I didn't even know was ready to play. Yeah. And did that have an impact on you as far as how you were thinking about it yes, or how you were? It did. So there was this thing called enmeshment, right? So it means yeah. the, the family gets sometimes a little too close, a little too intertwined. And uh, so then in my uh in my in my marriage dynamic i'm trying to remember exactly how there was just always this tension i felt between like i wasn't doing enough for my family of origin and then here's this new guy and his husband and such and yet he was not treating me well by the way there was abuse involved so so then i'm trying to trying to make that all work but what i i this tension that i had internally which was you were a really close family we seem like the all american and there was always a part of me that said, but I want to be, I want to go away for a while. I don't want to, I love you and I need my space. And I think it was because of that sense of, of enmeshment, which was all like from a loving point of view, kind of a thing. Exactly. So right. I had to, it, it helped me to go, regardless of what happens with my marriage, I have to figure this out in a healthy way for myself because I still right. have my family of origin and I still want to have an adult life and I still want to have a marriage and who knows what, if I'm going to have a family at that point, I was in my twenties. And so it was, so, so yes, that was really helpful. And it immediately kind of gave me an exhale in terms of, because my ex was trying to pull me away from my family of origin. I mean, that was also a part of that negative dynamic and I wanted to go towards them yet. I didn't want to be a mesh with them. So I was just confused. So this helps sort it out for me. Wow. And you know, that, that example that you're, that you're talking about is very, very relevant in many cases of not all, but in some cases of estrangement and meshment is really playing a central role. And what you described is, you know, you've, you've married, there's this husband and, from the family's point of view, it may be, oh, he came onto the scene and right. now she doesn't want to talk to us. Mm -hmm. So they they would would place all of the uh, blame on the husband for coming in and stirring the pot and ruining a perfectly happy family. But in fact, what you experienced on the inside was you were aware of of kind of feeling the constraints of even loving enmeshment. Yep. And and basically, enmeshment is just that the boundaries are are not very clear between who's who. So if one person in the family is going through something, we're all going through this. If one person has a feeling, we're all having this feeling. Or if one person has a diary and they don't want it to be read, then they're keeping secrets. That's how enmeshed families think about privacy is, well, you know, why do you have to keep secrets? So that's that's one aspect of, of some enmeshed families. But yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was highly relevant. 
I also wanted to say, because we were talking about therapy and, and what you got out of it, I often get asked, should I use an estrangement specialist? I can't find anybody who knows anything about parent adult child estrangement. And I, I want to say that that does not matter because therapy is not about sitting down with a therapist and having them decide, help you write a letter to your child or figure out when to send, whether to send a birthday card. That's not therapy. That's something else that might be consultation. Uh, you can maybe do that with a friend or, or, or you can do it with your therapist, but but make no mistake, that means that you're using that time not to do therapy, but to do something else. Because therapy is about you and your emotional landscape and your personal history and what's going on for you and what patterns are you maybe um, have have been stuck in that aren't serving you. Well, that means that any good therapist can help a person who a parent who's unwillingly estranged from their child as long as they focus on themselves. And I absolutely recommend self-focus during estrangement. Again, not to pinpoint your shortcomings or or focus on your flaws, but to understand. Because the more we understand ourselves, the easier it is to understand the experiences of others. Mm. I love that distinction. Thank you for bringing that part up, that um, we could really can work with many type therapists and, uh, and, and being able to, because we're working on ourselves. And, um, you know, I love that you also going back to what you said in these very specific ideas about, um, how to, you know, get some of that power back and, and start to reconcile that relationship, um, with an estranged adult child, uh, it, which really is start with yourself, right? These are things you do with yourself or on yourself that you said, well, two, three, and four were about boosting resilience, your resilience. So yeah. again, just a, the, the two, three, and four ideas were develop self-compassion, find your own center. In particular, what came to my mind is working on being present. What does it mean? Mm -hmm. to be present can be a, one of those tools to like who, who, your own center where, where you're at. Um, and the number three was to get support. We think of resilience as I'm bouncing back and I'm going to like it could be boost on your resilience to go get that child again or go, you know, bring them back into the fold or bring them back in that relationship. But really you're saying, no, boost your own resilience internally about how you operate in the world and how you see it. And, the, and before you're taking any immediate action, if any, towards yeah. uh, your estranged child. Exactly. I, I definitely see resilience as the ability to come back into equilibrium emotionally. Mm -hmm. When something has got you down, a, a situation may not be solvable immediately, but you can, you know, if you want to say bounce back into a place of empowered calm, let's say. I mean, that's, that's, that's a high bar for, yeah. <laughs> for unwillingly estranged parents, but that's the goal. I mean, you, you that's the goal, not yeah. not just to get the child back, but what will that do for you mm -hmm. when the child comes back? What are you seeking? What feelings, what experiences are you wanting to have by being in connection with your child? Maybe you want to feel safe in the world. You want to feel a sense of belonging. You want companionship. What do you want and how do you get that even during estrangement? Wow. Wow is right. That's plenty for the first part of our conversation. And now for the after party, I call Flip the Chip, where I take a few moments to highlight something my gal pal shared that can help us all flip a challenge or a difficulty that's holding us back into something more positive that helps us move forward. It's easy to feel powerless when you are estranged from an adult child. What I want to highlight today are the four things Tina shared that you can start doing today if you find yourself in this situation. Number one, try to understand why the estrangement is happening from your child's point of view. Do some brainstorming of possibilities. Educate yourself with a trained expert, be it a book, article, video, or therapist. Keep exploring. Number two, develop self-compassion. Self-compassion is a foundational tool for yourself. Be kind to yourself. As Tina said, you are suffering. Number three, find your own center. Become more connected to yourself. Become more comfortable in your own body and in the current moment. 
And number four, get support. If you have an unresolved trauma from the past, maybe that's a little T or a big T, get support with a trained therapist to reflect and heal, perhaps heal again and more deeply. Of course, you can always use your nail color to cheer you on by simply putting on a new color and giving it an inspiring name. You'll have to listen to part two of my conversation with Tina to find out what name she suggests. But whatever name you choose, or none at all if you're Naked Nelly, the truth is you can make choices to create the career, business, and life you want. One step, one nail color at a time. I look forward to being with you next time on the Live Like Your Nail Color podcast. Thanks for listening to the Live Like Your Nail Color podcast. Ready to live and laugh more? Know a friend who could use some of that too? Then subscribe at livelikeyournailcolor.com or your favorite podcast app and share this episode right now with the person who popped into your mind. Together, let's flip the chip to be stronger, smarter, and happier. 